All right, let's talk about climate change, the highly controversial topic. Uh, huh. Not necessarily the best first slide for a climate change lecture. Honestly, I'm not even going to talk that much uh, about renewables or even the solutions to climate change, but uh, I'm just drawing here. Uh, but I actually took this image in, uh, or I took this picture in, in uh, Kansas, I think, uh, or maybe a no, yeah, in Kansas, uh, about three years ago, just snapped it from my car, just driving from my phone, and I just thought it was a good picture, and that uh, I'd share it. So, so there you go. Very pretty windmills. No, no climate change lecture is complete without a few uh, big wind turbines in it. So, what are we going to cover? Uh, climate change can and is taught as an entire course, although I'm just going to try to hit the the basics of it, and honestly. There'll be one slide I show you where it is essentially the the supreme sort of encapsulated basics of climate change. Uh, the interesting thing about climate change, or rather, you know, human-induced uh, climate change, is that it's it really is kind of a the, the underlying issue or the underlying uh, causes are rather simple. It's not something that's super complex. Um, how the earth reacts to it is super complex and difficult. The physics of how a greenhouse gas uh, occurs is is difficult, but you can sort of pare this down into a rather simple, simple problem. I mean, it, it truly is not difficult to teach the basics of climate change, and that's what I'm going to do here in this lecture. And I'm try trying to just not, you know, get it down into about a half hour thing. Um, instead of spending hours and hours and hours talking about this, which I I can. I've been talking about climate change or global warming um, since 2009, I think. So I've been at this for about 11 years. Uh, and I've done it in higher education. I've done it as an educator at a museum. I've done it through with uh, K through 12 audiences in classrooms. Um, this is something that's, that's going on and it's part of our uh, reality now. And it's something I had to do, honestly, when I was doing my own research, it's something I had to attribute for when I was looking at the uh, stable isotopes of the teeth that I was looking at. I, I had to account for the amount of greenhouse gases we've added to the atmosphere in the last hundred years or so. I had to add that to my equation to try and figure out exactly what, what was going on with my research. But anyway, what are we going to talk about? Well, first off, uh, we'll just do the supreme kind of basics. Uh, and honestly, if you feel like you kind of uh, know this stuff, you can skip ahead in this lecture till we kind of till I get down here to greenhouse gases. So feel free to do that. But uh, if you know climate change is a subject you're familiar with, but I'll start off with talking about the difference between climate and weather. Uh, what is climate change? What is global warming? What's the difference? Um, also, what what's in the atmosphere? How big is it? Honestly, you should look at this too, even if you are familiar with climate change. Uh, then we'll get into greenhouse gases. What's the greenhouse gas effect? How that has to do with changing the climate? How do we know things have changed? And this is something we've sort of always hopped around uh, the entire semester when we talk about geologic time. You guys know now that there have been changes and you can see evidence for yourselves in the rocks of those changes. Uh, I'll get into anthropogenic climate change, which is human-induced climate change, basically what's going on today. And then also, this is something I've tried to wrap my head around. You know why? Why should we care? And I'm not saying like, why should you should care as a global citizen and as a voter and as a whatever. I've always tried to pare this down to what's gonna happen to you? How is this gonna affect you? How is this gonna affect the money you make and the money, the, the things you spend your money on? How is it going to directly affect you? So I kinda wanna take a look at, not, not just the, I'll real fast go through the global issues, and then I'll, I'll run into like the, the Arkansas issues and then get into like, what's this going to do to your pocketbook or what is it already doing to your pocketbook? Anyway, so let's begin. So first off, weather versus climate. Weather describes what the atmosphere is doing over short time scales, right? I can Google, you know, the weather on Google and it pops up with something like this. It tells me what's happening on a daily basis, you click on these things and it'll tell you what's happening per hour. And then, you know, we try to forecast later out into the week. This is the weather. It's basically what it's doing outside right now or in the very near future. You cannot take 
you cannot take a weather event and look at it and say, this is the result of climate change. And I'll probably explain more about that uh, later here in a minute. And it's, I cringe every time a hurricane happens or a massive thunderstorm happens, because you can't point to this singular event and say, this is caused by climate change. You can't point at a single dot. You need multiple points. I can point to multiple storms over time because they create a trend. That is change and climate. So what is climate? Climate is the average weather pattern in a region over long periods of time. It's the weather averages over time, long periods of time. How long? The actual definition is about 30 years, but you can sort of, you can change that, right? You can look at time scales of 100 years, 1,000 years, whatever, and you can look at long-term trends uh, over that. In geology especially, we look at something called Milankovitch cycles, uh, and those are cycles that are due to the wobble of the Earth and how the Earth actually kind of wobbles around like a top, um, and it causes changes in, in the climate, especially during the last several ice ages, right? We didn't just have one ice age. We had a bunch in the last couple million years, and that's due to the fact that the Earth kind of has this weird wobble to it. And um, well, you, you can go look it up. I'm not. I don't want to spend too much time on it. It takes a while talking about that stuff. Uh, but feel free to just go uh, Google, you know, ice age cycles, and I'll, I'll point you guys to a, a video that uh, that has it. But anyway, main point: climate is the average of weather over long periods of time. Here's the climate data for Arkansas. So you've got all these weather averages down here. This is essentially the climate, sort of what you expect to occur for average lows, average highs, and record lows and highs are in here. Not, not These aren't so much climate, but these average highs and average lows, and kind of what you should expect for the average precipitation and snowfall and, and so forth. So, Climate's the average of weather patterns over time. You know, it could be precipitation, could be temperature, like I just pointed out. Climate change is when this stuff changes. It's when those averages change. And honestly, it's always happened, right? When I first started teaching about climate change, the denial I was sort of grappling with is that, oh, the climate doesn't change, which is kind of insane. The climate naturally changes. You can't, you know, we can go pull the bones of a woolly mammoth up, you know, at a place in Arkansas in the Mississippi uh, lowlands, and you, you can recognize that, hey, it used to be a lot colder here. We've got evidence of glaciers just north of here. It used to be a lot colder. We know the climate changes, and we've seen it happen on human time scales. However, what's happening today is a little bit different, but we know the climate changes over time. The question is, you know, how much? And the big topic for today that is political in today's world, uh, and there's good reasons for it being political, is anthropogenic climate change or human-induced climate change. Basically, we're doing stuff to change the climate, and we will talk about uh, what that is. So that's climate change. What about global warming? Global warming is just the average temperature of the whole planet increasing over time. And this is kind of how we used to talk about, especially when it was first being discussed, is, oh, global warming, global warming, global warming. Oh, and then it got changed to talking about it and saying, oh, well, now it's it's climate change. Well, why do we, why do we discuss uh, climate change now instead of global warming? Frankly, you know, you can still talk about global warming. It's not wrong. Uh, however, climate change is kind of just pointing to the fact that in some places it may not actually get warmer. It may actually get colder. How's that work? Well, the simple example is uh, if I've got, I'm going to draw a map of the world real quick and it's going to be terrible. Um, if I've got North America over here, there's Florida and then South America's down here and then the Caribbean. Uh, and then I've got Africa over there and then Asia uh, up here and England. That's not too bad. Something that occurs here is there is a large uh, oceanic current that travels up here th to the North Atlantic. It brings a lot of warm water from the equatorial region up here, oops, 
up here to the northern Atlantic, and it hits Europe. It hits this area, and it actually makes it a lot warmer, plus for warm. If you can shut down this current, this region will get a lot colder. It will become much cooler. Uh, a good example of this is, you know, everybody wants to move to California because the weather is great way over here in California, right? Why is it so great over there in California? Because it's sitting next to the Pacific coast where it is very cold. It is very cold to go swimming in the Pacific Ocean on the west coast, anywhere along California. That sort of insulates California and gives it that really mild weather. It never really gets super hot in California, or it's very rare. Uh, over here along the Gulf Coast, the water is warm. It'll still be 95 degrees down here during the summertime because you've got that warm water. Versus over here in California, you've got much colder currents uh, that are hitting that part of the coast, and it just makes it cooler. Well, the Gulf Stream over here uh, makes Europe warmer. If you shut this off, Europe goes into a little miniature regional ice age. How much colder? I'm not sure. I'd need to go research it. Feel free to do it on your own. Um, how would you shut this off? I don't want to go too much into it, but basically you melt all the ice up in the Arctic. Uh, this current is actually, it goes back down underneath deeper in the ocean and kind of circles back around. Uh, and it's partially driven, not just by warmth, like a, a convective warmth cycle. It's also driven by salt. And if you melt all this ice that's up here in the north part of the planet, uh, you will make the, wa the ocean water less saltier, and it'll actually slow down this current and potentially shut it down. And we think this might have happened in the past and had something to do with the, uh, the big mass extinctions that happened in, uh, in North America and partially what killed all the woolly mammoths and, and everything else. Um, poor woolly mammoths, but... Uh, that's called the Younger Dryas. Feel free to research it on your own. It's uh, very fascinating. But anyway, all that aside, global warming just is talking about, on average, the planet is getting warmer. We just tend to talk about climate change now because we realize, yeah, there's going to be a lot of changes and some places may actually get cooler and some places are getting cooler. Anyway. Uh, and the asterisk is basically for what I just talked about. So, example, uh, we have had a changing climate. The globe has warmed, and what we're looking at here, and I'll try not to hit you guys with too many graphs, but uh, this is modern day right here, time zero. This is years times 1,000 before present. So this is 50,000 years ago back here. And so we can see that it got warmer and we came out of the ice age, right? It got warmer, global warming, right there especially. So that's the essence of global warming and climate change. Let's talk about the atmosphere. What is the atmosphere made out of? All this is about warming the atmosphere. So what's it made out of? Mostly it's nitrogen and then a little bit of oxygen. And so there they are, nitrogen, N2, and oxygen, O2. This is the stuff you breathe. And then there's a little bit of argon. And then there's this little tiny sliver of other stuff. That other stuff is mostly CO2, along with some uh, noble gases, a little skosh of methane, and, and some of these, these other elements, a little bit of hydrogen. Um, and so that's what the atmosphere is made out of. How big is the atmosphere? This is the thing that kind of blows people's minds. And again, back when I used to talk about this around 2010 or so, it used to be that, you know, oh, the climate can't change. It's, it never changes. And that kind of died away. And that's not really the argument anymore. And a part of the argument was, oh, well, the atmosphere is too big. You can't change the atmosphere. Uh, it's just too large. Well, how big is it? And here's the amazing thing. If any of you go flying, if you take a flight anywhere, you got to wait for the, uh, the airline attendant to kind of do their little song and dance about putting on your seat buckle. And then also if the mask drops down, you need oxygen. Well, why would you need oxygen in an airplane? You're flying through the atmosphere, right? There's oxygen out there, right? Let's look at this uh, over here, this, this graph. This shows, this graph shows first on this side the altitude in miles and then the pressure of the air 
And basically we're looking at the amount of gases in the atmosphere as you go up in, in elevation. And generally speaking, when people ask, oh, how high is the atmosphere? The answer is about, if I remember right, it's about 100 miles or so. And feel free to Google that. I, I could be wrong, but it's somewhere in there. Or it's 100 kilometers, 150 kilometers, something like that. Well, that's not where most of the atmosphere is. That's just kind of the upper limit of the atmosphere. Most of the atmosphere ends at about right here. Less than five miles up. This is 5.5 kilometers up. So we got kilometers on this side, miles on this side. You go up, even to some of the tallest peaks. In fact, if you go up to uh, some of the peaks in outside of Denver that are 14,000 feet up, um, you're, you're close to this, this level. Uh, there's oxygen masks that are up there on top of that mountain in case anybody has trouble breathing because there's literally less oxygen up there, a significant amount uh, less. The majority of the Earth's atmosphere is under five and a half kilometers or under five miles. Think about that. That's why you have to wear a mask on an airplane if it depressurizes, because you're up here at around six miles or so, and there's, what is that? That's probably like, what, 75% of the atmosphere is now underneath you? There's not enough O2 for you to breathe. You will suffocate. You get above 10, 10 miles, you're absolutely suffocating. You are pow. You are, you are out. So... This is something to think about. There's really not that much atmosphere. You can get in your car. If you could get in your car and just point it straight up and drive for five minutes, uh, you'd start to suffocate. There wouldn't be enough oxygen in the atmosphere for you to survive. If we took all of the atmosphere and rolled it up into a ball with the pressure of one ATM, or basically the pressure at, of air at sea level, right? So the air we kind of breathe if you're at, at zero, zero feet up, if you're down on the coast. If you put all the atmosphere into a single bubble, uh, to a single ball, it would be this big, this little pink ball right here. Or about the size of, what is that? I don't know, Alaska? Something like that. It's not very big. The atmosphere is extremely thin. If we were in the classroom, uh, I'd do a little two-scale drawing on the, uh, on the board. And I'd try to draw the actual thickness of the atmosphere, and I would use the entire board. I'd use all, like, 20 feet of it that's up there. And I still, it would, the, the thickness of the atmosphere would look like that compared to the, the rest of the thickness of the Earth. Um, it's super, super, super thin. There's really not much there. It's not that hard to change this little pink ball. That's what I'm getting at. So... How do we do that? How do we change the temperature of this little pink ball of, of this atmosphere that covers uh, our planet? Well, greenhouse gases tend to be the culprit. Uh, what are greenhouse gases? They are molecules like H2O or CO2. These are molecules of atoms. And they absorb radiation, and then they'll re-admit it. Right, so greenhouse gases on here, there's CO2, that's a greenhouse gas. Basically, the way it works, and the best analogy I think I can give you is it's like a blanket. If you put up a lot of these greenhouse gas molecules, uh, the more you put up in the atmosphere, it's like putting on more blankets if you're sleeping on the bed, right? If it's cold at night, you put one sheet on, it'll keep you a little bit warm. If you put more sheets on, they'll keep you warmer. And the reason for that is some of your heat is escaping back out through the blanket. But the more blankets you put on, the less heat that escapes. And that's because these molecules, on an individual basis, they will absorb the infrared radiation, also known as heat. Same thing, infrared radiation. Now you can sound smart. Uh, they'll absorb, these molecules will absorb that and then re-emit it. It's just like sticking a, a rock outside in the sun. You can bring it inside and the rock is warm, right? It's re-emitting that heat that it absorbed. These molecules do the same thing and not everything does it, amazingly enough. Uh, oxygen on its own won't do it and then nitrogen on its own won't do it. These things do it. So, 
greenhouse gas effect keeps the earth warm. If we didn't have these greenhouse gases, the little bit of CO2 we have, we'd have an extremely cold planet. Um, <clears throat> and then they absorb the long wave radiation, uh, also known as, as infrared. Uh, I'm not going to spell that out. Infrared or, you know, heat. If you want to blow people's minds, uh, infrared radiation. Infrared is basically a color, right? You just can't see it. Well, you can feel it because it's heat. Your mind is blown. Anyway, acts like a blanket. Uh, if the heat from the sun warms the planet, it never escapes, right? If it's absorbed by these molecules, it kicks it back down in the atmosphere, and things just get warmer and warmer. And like I said, it's kind of like bed sheets. Uh, but the more greenhouse gases we get, the more warmth is trapped, just like sheets or blankets. So, which molecules are the greenhouse gases? H2O, water, is a greenhouse gas. CO2 is the big famous one. CH4, also known as methane. Meth. I better finish spelling this and not leave it as meth. I'll get in trouble. Methane. Uh, and then NO2, which is nitrous oxide, right? Yep. Pretty sure. Uh, these are the things that are big greenhouse gases, and they're not all created equal, right? A molecule of methane can absorb a lot more radiation and emit a lot more radiation than a molecule of CO2 can. However, there's a lot more CO2 in the atmosphere than CH4. We'll look at that in a second. So in all these molecules we're looking at around here in the atmosphere, uh, nitrogen is not a greenhouse gas, oxygen is not a greenhouse gas, argon is definitely not a greenhouse gas. Uh, and then we take this tiny little sliver here and look at the rest of these. Uh, these things, oh, wait, 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 wait. Wait, are you waiting? Wait. That is, and that is. And there's not much to them, right? It's 0.04% of the atmosphere. Not very much. Not 4%, 0.04%. And that's the majority of our greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. That's doing the majority of our warming, that is the majority of our bed sheets, right? There are others, these aren't the only ones, right? These ones I listed, there are some others, uh, but they are in minuscule amounts and they have a very uh, small effect and a lot of them are large molecules, um, but anyway. So, of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, uh, how, how much of sort of each are them? If we took 100% of the greenhouse gases, so let's say this is all the greenhouse gases and they equal 100% of all greenhouse gases, uh, who's what? Well, for the most part, water vapor is the majority of the greenhouse gases. Oh, oh, I should back up. I, miss, I misspoke. I said CO2 did the majority of the warming. Water vapor plays a massive, massive, massive part. Good old H2O. So, a majority of the greenhouse gases in our atmosphere are H2O, a little bit of CO2, and then the rest of everything else is one, about 1.4%. Uh, and then later on, we'll get into talking about what we're emitting as humans. And for the most part, what we emit is mostly CO2 along with some methane and some nitrous oxide, which I think comes from uh, farming practices, and some other weird weird fluorinated gases, chlorofluorohydrocarbons, these big, big crazy molecules that also uh, have a small effect. But this is the stuff we emit. And you go, huh, uh, Travis, where are you going with this? Because that's, uh, that's a big number down there, and I thought global warming is all about the CO2. And I would say, yes, that is a very excellent observation. I'm glad you've been thinking this. You're paying attention, uh, gold or maybe red star for you. Um, good, good job. Good job. Here's the deal about the water vapor, though. If we put more water vapor into the atmosphere, what happens? The atmosphere can only hold so much water vapor. It's basically at a constant. Because if you put water vapor, too much water vapor into the atmosphere, what what happens? That's right. It rains. 
it just falls right back out. And this happens fairly quickly, right? You can evaporate water from the from the ocean and floats on land and then it precipitates out as rain. It happens within a few hours sometimes. So it goes somewhere else rather quickly. What about CO2? If we start dumping extra CO2 in the atmosphere, what happens to it? Well, that's a good segue into the carbon cycle. And that is basically how carbon, not just CO2, but carbon in general, uh, moves throughout our whole global global system. Although this is this is actually showing CO2, but uh, so so. And the reason I say carbon and just not CO2 because this CO2, uh, if you remember, we've seen. I used to harp on this a lot, CO3, especially when I put this in front of it. Calcium carbonate, remember what that was? Something stone, limestone, remember that? Limestone, when it precipitates, when it grows, will take up CO2, right? So that's kind of why we call this the carbon cycle, because uh, it's not just CO2, but it's kind of how CO2 moves around and it can happen in different can sort of change into different molecules. So anyway, this is the global carbon cycle. It's kind of how CO2 moves around or carbon moves around. There's a lot of exchange between the ocean and the atmosphere. It is giving and taking quite a bit. And when you have more in the atmosphere, more actually comes out of the atmosphere than comes out of the ocean. Just a little bit more, if you notice that uh, net influx. Uh, the ocean, there's a lot of it kicking around in the ocean. There's a lot of CO2 that exists uh, dissolved into the ocean. In addition to the ocean, we've got soil respiration, we've got plants respiration, we've got photosynthesis, and these are big numbers, right? Larger numbers. And then over here, we've got what people do. Uh, we've got land use from just clearing the land and farming, and then we also have uh, fossil fuel uh, emissions, which are adding about 7.9 uh, billion metric tons down here per year into the atmosphere. And these numbers are small. They are small compared to these large numbers. But all these other numbers are in equilibrium. They're not changing that much. Or if they are changing, they are changing very, very slowly. The rates at which these change is very, very slow. And by very, very slow, I mean geologic time, right? On the order of maybe thousands of years, uh, if not millions uh, of years, geologic uh, time. There's my little clock. So the analogy I used to kind of give to people uh, is a good way to think about global warming or the, the increase of CO2 in our atmosphere, uh, it's kind of like looking at a swimming pool, like a large in-ground swimming pool. What happens? You've got a whole bunch of water in the swimming pool. You have a filter system that exists. That filter system pulls water out of the pool, filters it, and then kicks it back in. That's kind of like our global carbon cycle. Uh, however, if you just drop a small garden hose into the pool, if there's nowhere for it to go, eventually the pool will fill up more and more and more. Uh, that's kind of the idea with this extra, uh, C these extra CO2 emissions. Um, and this will extrapolate the greenhouse, or it will make the greenhouse gas uh, um, effect increase, right? It'll hold in more warmth just by putting up a little bit of extra CO2, but we're doing it every single year, and we've been doing this for... Eh, about 150 to 200 years now, which is quite a bit of extra uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. This is a little bit comical. Uh, this tells you how old this this picture is, uh, 360 parts per million. Uh, in other words, that's 0.036% CO2. What was it on the other slide we looked at? It was 0 0.04 something percent. When I first started teaching this stuff, this is about the level it was at, this 360 parts per million. And now I think it's, what, at 420? So every time I teach this 
this lecture, I actually have to increase the limit of the CO2 in our atmosphere. And in the last, well, we'll look at it, but in the last few hundred years, uh, it's practically doubled. Um, anyway, I'll come back to this. I'll talk about this later. I think I'm done drawing on this slide. So greenhouse gas effect. You change the amounts of the greenhouse gases in our atmosphere uh, and it will change the climate, right? It will make it warmer or if you remove it, it will make it cooler. And we will see this effect on in the ocean and in the land and there's a whole lot of secondary effects. Uh, there's a lot of heavy duty science that's involved with predicting what happens. But the thing is, is we've seen this happen in Earth's history over and 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 over again. You guys got a taste of this when we talked about the major events in Earth's history. Uh, you remember when photosynthesis happened, when the snowball Earth happened. These were events where the greenhouse gases were affected and did change. Is that a misspelling? Dang it. Anyway, uh, we know what we know is what we know what happens. Sorry, I get passionate. We know what happens when we increase the greenhouse gases. It's not a mystery. The, the rocks tell us what has happened in the Earth's past when uh, you increase CO2 or methane or whatever greenhouse uh, gas it is. How might these changes happen? Uh, if you increase heavy volcanism, especially flood basalts. It's kind of why I had that one question that one time. We talked a little bit about this. This is, we, there's no flood basalts that are occurring today. Um, imagine Hawaii, the Hawaiian Island that just spews out a lot of lava. Imagine something like that, but times 100, uh, where it's just tons and tons and tons of lava that's coming out of the ground. And it's a releasing enough uh, greenhouse gases, mainly CO2, that if it occurs over thousands of years and keeps on happening, you can change the climate. It will put up enough. Um, imagine single-celled critters all of a sudden evolving photosynthesis and you, all of a sudden you've got CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, imagine an asteroid hitting somewhere in the Gulf of Mexico and releasing a whole bunch of sediments and methane hydrates that exist there and killing the dinosaurs. And then imagine 7 billion humans uh, combusting every single hydrocarbon we can find that give off greenhouse gases as byproducts with an atmosphere that's only about five miles above our head. It's not hard to imagine the atmosphere changing and getting warmer or colder. So how do we know this happens? Uh, well, it's the end of the semester. We've already talked about a lot of this. Um, we can look at the changes in rock types. Uh, if you remember back to sedimentary rocks, they can tell us about the types of environments that once existed. Uh, we can look heavily at fossils. We know what kind of animals like certain types of temperatures. We can look at the isotopes in certain fossils that can tell us uh, about the temperatures uh, in particular. These aren't fossils, but they're very close to being fossils. Uh, these are stalactites, right? Stalactites and stalagmites. These are cave formations. There's These things are basically limestone. They're made out of calcium carbonate, and I can go look at that carbonate. I can actually take a chunk of this stuff. Uh, I can go burn it. I can literally burn this stuff, and it will give off CO2. I can measure that CO2. Uh, and measure the isotopes that are in there and actually say something or figure out something uh, about the temperature when this cave formation uh, formed years and years ago. Other more modern methods and the more famous ones dealing with climate change are ice cores. Uh, they will trap little bubbles of air when they when they freeze. <coughs> Excuse me. We can look at the molecules that are in there and we can figure out what was going on with the atmosphere when those little air bubbles uh, froze in those ice cores. <clears throat> the really famous ice cores are from the Lake Vostok region of Antarctica, where they got about, uh, if I remember right, I think it was about 600,000 years of ice forming in Antarctica. So it's 600,000 years of really, really good data of seeing what happened through the, through the ice ages. <clears throat> so. What's happening today? And remember how I mentioned at the beginning, there's kind of one slide that really boils down climate change. This is it. These are kind of my points that I've collected. I don't think other people really talk about this, or at least they do in, in some manner, but not exactly this. So 
human caused climate change. One, we know how big the atmosphere is and what it's made of. We talked about that. Two, we can measure and estimate how much we're emitting. We can get a good estimate of how much gas we're emitting into the atmosphere, right? We know what's doing the combusting. We know the power plants that are doing it. We know the cars. We know about how many cars there are. We know how many power plants there are. We can measure the emissions that are coming out of these things, out of their smoke to stacks, and most of them are measured. Um, so we know how much we're giving off and how much we're adding. And so basically you just add one, number one here and number two here, and you can estimate how much more greenhouse gases are going to be in the atmosphere. And guess what? It works. Um, and we can also take that and we can model and figure out how much more energy, how much warmer the atmosphere is going to be due to these greenhouse gases, right? Sort of back of the napkin math. We know how big the atmosphere is, we know how much gas we're adding to the atmosphere, and we know about how much warmer it's going to make it on average, on average. So the basic results of these three points absolutely mean we will and are seeing changes. You can't get away from it. You can't throw up billions of tons of CO2 into the atmosphere and not expect to see some change. You just can't. It doesn't just magically go away. It doesn't wisp away into the outer space. So to hit it home, the Earth's atmosphere is getting warmer. We are definitely causing it. And there will be a lot of changes because of it. What those changes are, that's difficult. The Earth is a dynamic place. It is hard to figure out what the weather is going to do a week from now. The world moves, right? There's all these continents all over the place. There's liquid, there's gas, there's rocks. It's difficult to figure out exactly what will happen. And I think a lot of the arguments are born out of that fact, about that uncertainty. Well, you can't tell me what's exactly going to happen here and when and how, just like you don't trust the weatherman, right? I trust the weatherman. In fact, we're supposed to get really bad storms here in about an hour. I trust the weatherman. I know the science that is uh, backing him up, and I understand the probability of things. When somebody says there's an 80% chance of something happening, I understand that two out of ten times, that thing won't happen because that's the other 20%. Anyway, <clears throat> so what are we emitting? For the most part, uh, a lot of it has to do with our electricity production as well as our heat. Uh, our industrial uh, components have a lot to do with it. Transportation, so you know the fact that I drive a Prius occasionally is not going to save the planet when only 14% of our emissions are coming from transportation. Agriculture is causing a lot to our emissions, general buildings. Um, and I might need this breakdown myself. I don't know if that's like actual building the buildings using the concrete or, uh, or just the, uh, the, the emissions from buildings themselves. And then, then other energy. Anyway, you can uh, you can go look at all the different sectors and what's being emitted. There's great websites out there. Uh, EIA.gov. If you're a information junkie and a data junkie like me, man, go to this website. It is so cool. You'll see where your energy comes from. It it's just it's a cool website. Once you get used to kind of playing around and jumping around on it, uh, this this will help explain the world to you and what's going on. Uh, globally as a society, at least concerning our, uh, our energy. This is the Energy Information uh, Agency? Anyway, yeah, yeah, .gov. So we're emitting all this stuff. Uh, what's happening to it over here? I've got on this graph, I've got zero to 2000. Uh, eh, it's probably like 2010 in there. We can see the carbon dioxide screaming up. We can see the nitrous oxide increasing. We can see the methane increasing. And like I said, only back here, you know, around 1800, the CO2 in the atmosphere was what, 290, somewhere in there. And today, actually, this is backed off a little bit. So this is 390. I think today we're up at around 420. 
So I should have to, these should be extended. Uh, massive, massive increase. Where did this CO2 come from? The only culprit we've got is the stuff we're emitting. Like I said, we know we're emitting it. It's going somewhere. Guess what? It went right there. There it is. There's not magical volcanoes somewhere that are somehow emitting all this stuff. No, there's not. They're, they're, they're not there. We'd see them. We'd know them. And the first person to identify them would publish a paper on it, and they would become super famous. And that, that, that's something that I think is fantastic about uh, science in general. Most of society uh, runs on the economy, right? It, it runs on the dollar you want. You are trying to get a degree so you can probably make some money and you can buy things and have a nice, comfortable life and do the things you want to do. That's not quite how science operates. It's not, it's not so much about the money. It's, and this is a really bad way to put it, but it's not so much about the money. It's more about the ego. You like that? I just came up with that. It's more about the ego. Scientists don't really get rich. We can get paid a little bit of money to live comfortably, but you don't see millionaire scientists running around, not, not unless they got famous and wrote a book or something. Uh, they are all about the prestige. Ego might be a, a pretty nasty term, but prestige uh, is a better one. If somebody does bad science, everybody else wants to jump all over them and provide better science because you get published, you get more recognition, and you, you every, every scientist wants to be the famous science scientist. They want to make the great discoveries. They want to be the next Albert Einstein. Uh, they want to solve the world's problems. And if somebody else does bad science, one of the ways you can gain that notoriety is by jumping on them and pointing it out. So it's sort of self-regulating uh, in a way. Anyway, so that's a little fun fact. So CO2 is skyrocketing today. Uh, this is data from the, again, carbon dioxide. This is actually data from those Lake Vostok ice cores. And I lied. I said it went to 600,000. It went to 800,000. Uh, and we can see these carbon dioxide oscillations throughout time. This is due to these the ice ages that occurred. Uh, but again, we can see how it's just skyrocketed uh, over the last few years. Just just insane. I can back the date up a little bit more. I'm oh, sorry, this is temperature now. So looking at temperatures, this is a temperature anomaly. So essentially, this is the average temperature. And this is, we got year 2000, so modern day up here to about zero years ago. And we can see the changes through temperature. And the reason there's a bunch of different squiggly lines here is the data has gotten from different places. One of these might be an ice core. The other one might be a cave formation. The other one might be a piece of coral or a different ice core. Point being, they all kind of show you the changes that have occurred. You can get an average of these things. But what we notice is that, again, even the temperature, even the temperature is skyrocketing uh, over the last 100 years or so. And this is 2016, and actually I think it's up here around 1.0. Uh, today. Uh, who's doing the emitting? Um, I don't want to go too much into this. This is already going longer than I would have liked. Uh, it started out as mostly uh, the Western parts of the world, Western Europe, North America. We're largely emitting less these days. And as India comes online, as China comes online, uh, where the majority of the people on this planet live, uh, they're increasing their emissions as well. One of the nifty things you can actually see on this graph, see Eastern Europe here, see this big old dip? I'll give you a second to guess what caused that. The Cold War ended and the Soviet uh, Union collapsed. And so there's a lot less emissions coming from Eastern Europe. Anyway. Why do you care? Why you? Great. Okay. Globe's getting warmer. Things are getting hotter. Whatever, man. It's like one degree. You showed me. Who cares if it's one more degree hot outside? Is that really that big of a difference? Is one degree warmer? What do I care if it's 96 degrees instead of 95 degrees? Here's why. First off, there's a lot of global effects that are, gone, are going to occur due to this 
increased warming. We will see sea levels that are increasing. Flooding will get worse and already is getting worse. Uh, all that CO2 that you put into the atmosphere will actually dissolve into the ocean and it makes the ocean ever so slightly more acidic. And corals and small animals that can't deal with that, that make their shells out of calcium carbonate. Remember what happens when you put acid on a limestone? Exactly. Uh, storms will get more powerful and are getting more powerful. More droughts will happen. More flooding will happen. Dogs and cats will start living together. Mass hysteria. It will be insane. Anyway, so that's kind of the t standard narrative of climate change, right? It's all going to be bad. Um, all those effects, the ocean acidification one kind of keeps me up at night. Uh, and you're kind of getting my opinion here, but the uh, the sea level rise doesn't bother me all that much. We have incredible technology. We have uh, incredible engineers and, and, and people who want to work hard and solve these problems. And I think we can generally solve those problems. And not just the United States. I think the rest of the world can probably do a good job of solving a lot of those uh, issues, which I'll talk a little bit more here in a, in a little bit. But mainly my main global concern, uh, I'll talk about a little bit later. But what in Arkansas? I mean, the sea level is not going to get us. Even if you melt all the ice on the planet, you know how much the ocean's going to rise? About 200 feet, which is going to be bad for, you know, Louisiana and Florida. But even then, it's going to take centuries till that occurs. If you melt all the ice, right? All the ice, which is pretty much Antarctica and Greenland. Um, but how's this going to affect Arkansas? Well, research has already been done on this. In fact, you can get on Fayetteville, the city of Fayetteville's website, and they've got a little section about what, what to expect from uh, uh, climate change in, in this region. So first off, the weather we're going to see, uh, our springs are going to get a little bit drier up here. Our summers are going to get even drier still. And this is precipitation. Uh, these are changes from 1900 to uh, 2007. Our falls are going to get a little bit wetter, and our winters are going to need to get eh, slightly wetter. Uh, these are changes we've already seen, right? The, these aren't predictions. This already happened, right? This isn't what's going to happen. This already happened, and you can imagine that these trends will just continue. It will get Less water in the summer, less water in the spring, wetter in the winter, much wetter in the fall. If you're into gardening, you'll recognize this fairly quickly, uh, but these are the hardiness zones, or basically you use these to figure out what you want to plant and when. Um, I live up here in zone 7A, so when I figure out when I want to plant things, I look at a guide that says, okay, plant your zucchini. If you live in zone 7A, you plant your zucchini now, you plant your, your potatoes now, and then that sort of thing. Point being, you can see how even from 1990 to 2012, how these regions have changed. First off, we've just gotten better at it. We've gotten higher resolution. You can see how the lines here are much more precise versus the blobs that are over here. But you can see how everything's migrated north, right? So here we've got 7A. In 1990, I wouldn't be planting for what zone 7A says. I'd be planting for what zone 6B says. I'd actually be planting later on. Uh, instead of planting around April 15th, I'd be planting around May 1st. So these things have migrated north due to the warming. In just the 20-year period, this this represents. And this is real stuff. This has already occurred. I, in fact, I kind of would like to go, I should go pull up the hardiness zone map for now because this is eight years farther ahead. I think I'm smack dab in the middle of zone uh, 7A now. I don't think I'm right on the edge. But uh, anyway, what other changes are we seeing here? And like I said, you know, I'm talking about gardening, but this has big repercussions for the agricultural industry. I mean, like I mentioned, it's a two week difference in planting between these two, these two zones. Two weeks is a lot of time. There are certain things you can't plant in the summer if you don't have enough time. 
So what else is happening? Uh, the tornado alley is actually shifting to the east. Oh, what did I just show you? Do you see what I just showed you? It's awful. It's awful. It's awful. Do you see this? Do you see this? Where this came from? This came from the media outlet USA Today. I got nothing against USA Today. What I am against is the media. Uh, general news agencies can be really bad at reporting science. They are there. Why does, what is this? What, how does this website make money? How does USA Today make money? Do you know how they make money? By selling advertisements. You'll notice there's no advertisements over here because I've got ad blocker. Um, but they sell you advertisements. How do they get you to look at these advertisements? They sensationalize things. They say the end of the world is going to happen. Look at my article. Click here to see what happens to the end of the world. And you click and you see these advertisements and you know, maybe you go buy a t-shirt from The Gap or Bud Light or whatever uh, is over there on that thing. The news sensationalizes things to get your attention. And many times they will be, they will butcher the actual science. They will misstate what's going on. And it's not because they do it on purpose. It's just because they're not scientifically literate like you are becoming right now. They don't know how to read the article that this was based on. Spatial trends in the United States tornado frequency. That's not nearly as scary, right? Uh, this doesn't. This doesn't make me. This doesn't make me wide-eyed and scary. Spatial trends in the United States tornado frequency. Oh, this does. USA's infamous tornado alley may be shifting east. Run, run away. So anyway, I just want to point that out. Uh, this is part of your, your science education and being scientifically literate uh, and being aware of where something happens. And you know, this this article, they linked to that study. That's how I got to it, was just by clicking that link. So, you know, good on them for, for doing it, but recognize that, that this is occurring. You know, I also, there's a Wikipedia entry on this, and the Wikipedia cites this article, this USA Today article, when they should be citing this directly to the study itself. Anyway, back to what this is actually stating. Um, and here, here's the meat of it. Negative tendencies of tornado occurrence have been noted in portions of the central and southern Great Plains, while robust positive trends have been documented in portions of the Midwest and Southeast United States. Basically what's that saying is that there's less tornadoes now in Oklahoma than there was before, and now there's more towards the east. There's still more tornadoes in Oklahoma than there are here, but there's a shift happening where there's now more here than there used to be, and there's less over there than there used to be. And if you pay homeowners insurance, you might be noticing an increase, and it's due to that, and these insurance companies are perfectly stating it. They're saying, look, there's more tornadoes here now, it costs us more money to build houses and pay people money when their houses get destroyed. It's a real problem. So these are things that affect you. And as I say this, I'm literally under tornado watch right now. So that's kind of comical. Um, so these are some of the things we're seeing here in Arkansas. I've mentioned before, I've lived other places. And so it's, you know, it's hard to go outside and, and realize like how the climate has changed here in Arkansas because we're right in the middle of a continent, right? And we're not too far from the middle of the planet in general. Uh, global warming is exemplified towards the poles. So here we've maybe seen an average of a one degree increase over the last hundred years or so. If you go to Alaska, it's not a one degree change. You've seen seven degree swings. And this is something you can notice there are people that have lived up there for long enough through this whole period of time and they will tell you holy cow things are a changing the snow is far less than it used to be um, in anchorage um, and there's animals that now exist where they didn't used to exist or they're gone or there's plants growing that didn't used to grow here and it's it's fairly obvious one of the big ones is some of the problems with infrastructure 
uh, places that towns that rely on having an airfield when lakes or the ocean will freeze over and those areas no longer freeze over now so they can't bring in shipments uh, on airplanes or maybe they used to be able to do it for six months and now they can only do it for a couple of months uh, it's extremely these this change in this trend this warming trend in Alaska uh, it's extreme and anybody who's lived there for a recent amount of time it's it's painfully obvious uh, one of the laughable things that happened while I was there is I went to the Iditarod race uh, the beginning of it and that's the famous sled dog race uh, and one of the years I went they had to load snow on a train in Fairbanks Alaska and train it about 500 or 800 miles south however much it is uh, to Anchorage and they literally poured it out onto the streets so they could start the Iditarod in Anchorage because there wasn't snow and that's something that just didn't you know it's it's insane that that kind of happened that's just it sounds as crazy as, as it is. You start a sled dog race and there's no snow. There's always snow. There's plenty of snow. All of a sudden there wasn't. So, uh, has this affected people before? I'll go ahead and link this video. It's a little fun 10 minute video. Um, if you like a crash course, the crash course PBS stuff, this is a fun one. And it talks about the little ice age uh, and, and what occurred, but I'll go ahead and link that when I post this on canvas and go go watch that So what about my opinion on this? Uh, things I've told you or the things I know and the things I'm kind of an expert on and the things I'm about to tell you I'm not an expert on um, This is just me trying to understand in my uh, Layman life as to how the world works and what to expect First and foremost, I'm an optimist. I think we will probably get through climate change. I think we can engineer our way to it. We know that there is a problem. We generally know how to solve the problem. I'm not gonna talk about the solutions. They're fairly obvious. You either stop emitting greenhouse gases or you pull greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere, just like you're filling the pool with the hose, right? You pull the hose out of the pool or you open the drain in the pool, one or the other. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, anyway, so I'm an optimist. I think we can engineer our way out of this. Uh, I think Americans in general and wealthy countries uh, can adapt fairly easily, and we already are. Um, just, you know, you look at the flooding issues that already exist in Florida and Louisiana, and, you know, you can build larger levees, you can add pumps, and you, you know, you just increase taxes a little bit to pay for those things. We're wealthy enough that we can we can do that. My concern are the communities that are less well off and in history, historically, when we see large problems that are difficult to understand that aren't immediately obvious, uh, we tend to blame other people, right? You know, you're, you're living in Europe, the, uh, the Black Death comes and starts killing everybody. Oh, it's the French. They did this. They did terrible things. And this is all their fault. They brought this upon us. Let's go kill them. Um, oh, it's those people over there on the other side of the river. They wear blue. They're evil. This is their fault. The drought is caused by them, right? We, the, we have a long history of, of doing this. These aren't, this isn't something that happened once or twice. It's rampant. We try to take the easy way out. Uh, we don't try to understand the complex issues. So yes, we can adapt as more advanced countries. We can educate ourselves to solve these problems. We are slowly doing this, but will we have access to educate the other people around the world? Um, I think, you know, right now we're going through this COVID-19 crisis. I think it is a fantastic analogy for uh, climate change. I think the issues you're going to see in other countries, uh, as Americans, we will probably, your, your first reaction will probably be to laugh at them. Although some of our reactions, you can kind of laugh at them, but um, th there will be a lack of, of understanding and 
people will try to blame it on other things, or they will try to find answers uh, where there are none. What problems will these cause? I'm mostly concerned about the civil issues. Uh, when the going gets tough, uh, people will riot. Uh, there will be economic struggles. And as much as people, some folks don't like globalization, we live in a very globalized world where all of our commodities, uh, so many of them are manufactured overseas. Uh, it is hard to not affect those uh, as climate change gets worse and worse, right? Like I said, you know, if you have a large heavy drought that occurs for years and years and years and years, you might say, oh, this is your fault, or they'll blame their leaders or what have you, and you'll get a civil war. That civil war has a way of getting out of hand, and lo and behold, we're now paying for our military to go over there and deal with it. Your tax dollars are paying for it. More on that later. Individually, uh, how will this affect you? You're going to pay for it one way uh, or the other. You either invest. We either invest for solving the problem right now. Uh, that means you know there's a number of ways to do that, either through regulations or we create taxes that promote technology to do something about this, uh, and we try to mitigate the damage earlier or solve the problem earlier, or we wait until it's a lot more expensive because the problem has a way of compounding itself right you start with a small problem then it grows and grows and grows and causes other problems so how will you pay for this one your taxes you get taxed i don't know how i don't know where it could be at the people talk about uh fuel taxes contributing to this that hasn't been super popular but basically you get taxed for some sort of solution. You know, the simple thing would be, I make you pay a, an extra penny for every gallon of gas you buy, and we create the technology to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere to try and control it. Simple solution. I mean, it's not that simple, but you get the idea. Uh, you levy taxes to pay for all the issues that arise from it. Uh, security, like I mentioned. Uh, this is basically military is what I'm talking about. Uh, fixing the problems from the natural disasters this creates, the larger storms, the worst droughts. Uh, your goods and services will increase in prices. You will pay for the food technology. If all of a sudden the growing season is shorter, we need to be able to grow corn faster. Well, that's technology. That has to be engineered, manufactured. Genetic engineering is a great thing for that, and it exists, but it's not cheap. Um, if there's demand problems, supply and demand issues, that'll drive up prices. If there's logistic problems uh, due to increased storms during the hurricane season, all of a sudden you can't ship something where you wanted to ship before because the hurricanes have gotten worse. I don't know. Uh, flooding issues. Actually, <laughs> there's a good one. We just had those historic floods that happened along the Arkansas River. Uh, the Arkansas River is a major economic uh, highway for boat traffic. Due to those 500-year uh, floods, um, which are basically huge, huge floods, that got shut down. It's hurting a lot of people along the Arkansas River economically. They're passing that hurt on to you. I mean, there's no way they, they can't do that. Um, you'll pay increased insurance. Like I mentioned, homeowners insurance rates are going to go up around here because of the increased likelihood of tornadoes. The more tornadoes that happen in this area, the more your insurance is going to go up. You're going to pay for it. Uh you will pay for the solutions themselves. So instead of like taxes, you might pay for the regulations. So let's say we create a regulation that says, oh, cars can't emit that much more CO2. You'll have to pay for the mechanism in the car that reduces the CO2 emission. This is something that already happens. So again, you're already, you're already paying for this. You just might not realize it, but it's probably going to get uh, a lot worse. And it's the analogy of the, the frog in the boiling pot of water is a great analogy. We hardly realize we're doing this right now. And again, as the earth warms, it will, it will get worse. And we will pay for it more and more and more and more. So uh, how else is this already happening? And this was a, a great debate. So you may have heard of the Syrian civil war that's been raging for several years now. Now, to say it was caused by climate change... Uh, is a stretch. And I don't think most people would argue that, oh, climate change causes a civil, Syrian civil war. No, it didn't. However, it made it more likely, just like climate change can make a, uh, a hurricane more likely, 
uh, because the ocean is warmer, because the atmosphere is warmer, um, we can get larger hurricanes, and over time, we will. Climate change didn't cause the Syrian civil war, but there was a massive drought. And that drought, just like the hurricanes, can become more frequent or more uh, or worse uh, as they occur. So we can't, you can't just point to climate change and say, oh, it's climate change's fault. It made this drought. No, it didn't. It just made it more likely. It made it more possible. So how does that even, how, how would climate change have contributed to Syrian civil war? Well, there was this huge drought in, uh, in Syria and a lot of the rural population uh, basically fled their farms and they went into the urban population centers, they went into the cities. And whenever you combine rural and urban folks, just ask modern politics, uh, they tend to not get along too well. And uh, soon after, civil unrest happened and, you know, a bunch of farmers move into your town, take your job. Hey, these farmers are taking my job, you know, right? Uh, that civil war kind of exploded out of that. How else is it happening? How else are you already paying for it? Uh, here's a fun report. Reports on the effects of changing climate to the Department of Defense. The military actually uh, puts a lot of focus uh, into the effects of climate change and what's happening. The military has bases all over this planet. A lot of them are at sea level uh, and they have to be concerned about this. And look, the estimated cost of this report for the study is about $330,000. Boom, right there. Climate change just cost Americans $329,000. Uh, and if you look at the slides to this down in the bottom, I actually provided the link so you can pull up this PDF uh, if you want to flip through it and read it yourself. It's actually, I recommend it. It's, uh, you can just flip through it and get the summaries and everything. So that's kind of how it will affect you. Um, I'm going to be a little bit broader here uh, and just kind of talk about mass extinctions in general. Um, in the Earth's history, whenever we see rapid changes, we find mass extinctions. Whenever the, change, the climate changes very quickly, we get a mass extinction. And there's been six or seven of them, if you include day seven. The changes we are seeing now are the fastest we've observed. Think about that. Think about that, uh, that time scale thing we did, right? And how vast Earth's history was. We've got no evidence that the Earth has changed faster than it is changing right now. That's a heck of a statement for me to make. Here it is in graph form. So we're going back 20,000 years. Uh, here's 4,000 years. So year 2000 is about right there. There's 2100 up here. Right now we are about right there. You can see this rapid, rapid change, right? You can see how straight that line is. And yeah, it's not a massive increase. I mean, some of the arguments I hear about climate change is, oh, it's been warmer before. Oh, it's been colder before. Yeah, it has been a lot colder before. And yeah, back go back farther in time. It's been a lot warmer. I mean, when the dinosaurs are running around, this was a very warm planet. The Antarctica didn't even exist as far as ice is concerned. Um, we're still on a rather cool planet, but it's the rate of change that's the problem. You change things too quickly, life cannot adapt. It cannot evolve. It's too fast. Things will die. And unfortunately, we eat the things that live on this planet. And if they have problems, we have problems. So if anything else I want you to take away from this, uh, it's this point right here. The changes we are seeing today are the fastest we've ever observe. The temperature is increasing faster than we've ever seen. And again, looking at this graph, you can see just how fast it's increasing. Look, I drew the line up here about where it's at today. When this graph was made, it was down here. I imagine this graph was made just a few years ago. 2100. It's 80 years away. Where's 2150? You think somewhere in here? Somewhere right there? What do you think is going to happen between here and here? What else is going to die? Fisheries. Coral reefs, what? What uh, what kind of 
civil unrest is this going to create when the other uh, 7 billion people that don't live in America um, are trying to deal with this? It's a problem, and we, we, we need to start focusing on it as a society. There are solutions, and luckily, like I said, I've been teaching this since you know 2009 or so. I've watched progress happen. I've watched the argument change. I've watched it become more of a discussion politically uh, that gets talked about more and more and more and more. People are becoming more educated on it. There's more research happening uh, to understand the effects and also the mitigation. So I, again, I'm an optimist, but I do worry that we're a little bit of a frog in a boiling pot of water. And we're not appreciating uh, just how complex our society is and how much pressure it can or can't take. Anyway, that's all I've got for now. Uh, I was hoping this was going to take half an hour. Uh, it took me an hour and 10 minutes. So I'm sorry this is a long one, but I think it's important. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, I am always open. I'm, I'm very open-minded with this. Uh, I mean, for instance, the argument I've got my next slide is if somebody wants to talk to me about solar activity, you know, ask the question, could it just be the sun becoming more, uh, giving off more radiation? And that's something we measure. We've got a lot of satellites that look at the sun and how much radiation it gives off. And honestly, it's been going down for the last uh, couple of decades on average, and it does not match our temperature increases. So it's not the sun. Uh, Although, honestly, it does have some effect, right? You can see the peaks that correlate with it. It does exist. It does have a small effect, but overall, it's not driving this overall trend. But anyway, ask me these questions. I'm more than happy to talk about them. I'll try to point you to good quality scientific sources. Uh, I, you know, I try to argue this stuff from a very... I want you to learn, right? I'm not trying to win an argument. This isn't, yes, it's, I guess it can be emotional to me just because I recognize that this is a problem. It's been a problem for a while, but I'm here to show you things. So ask me questions if you've got them. Let me show you these things. That's all. Have a good one.